medicine burns when touched by fire. The smoke curls and spirals upward, and plumes of it rising, swirling, and pushing themselves in ribbons higher and higher until the smell of it becomes the ancient aroma of blessing, teaching, and communion. Within its fragrant cloud, you can feel peace descend upon you. There is spirit here. You can feel it if you allow it. And that is the heart of the teaching, the allowing. Welcome to the Urban Grief Shamans. Grief protests and stirs within us a profound defiance against living a life filled with numbness. It emboldens wildness, and like a thunderstorm, untamed. And as we learn, grief is the prime emotion for the soul's vitality. Contrary to common belief, grief is teeming with life. It resists being gentle, and yet moves us so passionately. There can be no doubt this emotion springs forth from the wells of the soul. In our podcast, we will explore this defiance, embrace its wildness, and find peace within its untamed vitality as we live in the hustle of everyday life. Join Patricia Jones, a psychotherapist, and John Moyer, a retired paramedic, as we explore the spiritual side of grief. Welcome to a journey of exploration and understanding as we delve into the depths of the human heart and soul. Today's episode invites us into the world of men's grief, a topic often shrouded in silence and societal expectation. Our special guest, Carl Rabke, brings a wealth of knowledge from the realms of somatics, embodiment, and soul work, offering us a unique perspective on the transformative power of vulnerability. Through his personal story and years of facilitating grief ritual, Carl sheds light on the paths that lead men through the shadows of grief towards healing and connection. As we navigate this conversation, we uncover the barriers that keep men's voices quiet in their sorrow and the profound impact of creating spaces where their grief can be expressed and witnessed. So join us as we embark on this deeply moving exploration, aiming to bring awareness, compassion, and a new understanding of the silent grief carried by many. So together, let's open our hearts to the unspoken stories of loss, transformation, and the resilience of the human spirit. Joining me today is Carl Rabke, an extraordinary person I had the pleasure of meeting at a grief workshop led by Francis Weller just recently. Our conversation today centers on a pressing question, In discussions surrounding grief and spiritual growth, why do we hear so few men's voices? So let's begin. Carl, would you kindly introduce yourself? Yeah, by way of introduction, I do a lot in terms of work (laughs) in the world. I I follow these winding threads of somatics and embodiment work and movement and soul work, grief rituals and men's work. And for me, they're the same thing. As Michael Mead likes to say, the primary movements of soul are slow and down. And it's often the same thing with our embodied presence. Mm -hmm. To return to our embodiment, it requires a slowing down and dropping in and back from the kind of up and out and speed of modern culture. So I find the two really help each other. A lot of times in witnessing embodiment and movement communities, I sense that they could use a little bit more soul. And in being in soulful communities, sometimes they could use a little bit more embodiment to really be with the felt reality of what they're working with. So that's something that I've done for many years and also followed similar paths with my wife, Erin. We teach together and host a podcast together. That's it. That's how I got to this moment of sitting here talking with you, John. How did you come across this movement? Like- so I was like many of us, I was pretty disembodied. I was also active. I was athletic. I played lacrosse, but I would use my body as an object and wasn't really sensing myself. And I got pretty injured playing that sport in college mm-hmm. and wound up having back surgery at the age of 21 and spent most of my college years with ongoing chronic pain. And I always say that I'm grateful to my 21-year-old self because the moment I came out of anesthesia from the surgery and felt the nerve pain gone, 
there was this recognition that if I didn't have some sort of radical reorientation, that I'd be back in that same situation. So it really caused me to look at how I was relating to my body, which was how I was relating to life itself. From shortly after that, I moved where I was living in Cape Cod, Massachusetts, U.S., and then I moved out to the mountains of Utah and came across all these different teachers. I started practicing martial arts and yoga and met a meditation teacher who worked with the practice as a real somatic embodied uh -huh. practice. And then I just followed the thread of massage school and rolfing training and Feldenkrais, which is another kind of movement awareness modality. Is this where you were first ran introduced to your mentors? Yeah, I would say most of them came in moving out west, although certain seeds were planted. I actually remember the first book I read in Utah was Clarissa Pinkola Estes' Women Who Run With the Wolves. Oh, yeah. And where I was introduced to uh, my dad's copy of Iron John and just devoured that book. And that really opened up this whole realm of uh, mythopoetic and men's work. So th those seeds were starting to come earlier. And then you met Erin when you were out West. Yes. So was she a big influence in your development? Yeah, I think we both have influenced each other significantly. And we have, we resonate with the same kind of essential frequency of what lights us up about Buddhism and the Dharma and what lights us up about deep ecology and soul work and work with grief and Joanna Macy's work that reconnects. So we follow our own threads, but we also really have this central refuge of connected to freedom and also connected to uh, meeting the great challenges of these times and the times we're living in and the times that are coming. So mm -hmm. I think each of us feel very grateful to have each other to bounce ideas off and to be inspired and to teach and hold space together. When did you come across Weller? We came across Francis Weller in the Sun article. That is how a lot of people were introduced to him. It was shortly after The Wild Edge of Sorrow came out. Mm -hmm. And actually, Aaron had, through a, a journey, had some specific instructions to work with holding space for grief. And mm -hmm. she realized she had, had no idea how to do that. So she reached out to... Francis and started doing some mentoring with him. And then I started mentoring with him as well. And uh, yeah, that was that. We've really both appreciated him as a mentor and friend. And there's such a beautiful body of work that he has cultivated around both work with grief and loss, but also in looking at what it is helps people ripen into adults and the community building and village growing work that he was so deeply influenced by Maladoma Somme, his mm -hmm. friend, taught alongside for several years. And yeah, we're very grateful to help hold community with Francis. I remember when I started to read Weller's book and Carl, it was just overwhelmed me with Francis' soulful language. It was such a light for me. I can't say enough about Weller's work one of those books it's probably one of the ones i've given away more <laughs> we have so many copies that we're constantly just passing out because <laughs> it is really um, a life-changing book and interestingly enough something in the fields because the, the year that francis's book came out was all that stephen jenkinson had a book coming out working with grief and martin prechtel also had a, a book coming out around grief and praise and, oh yeah and I, that I always am fascinating when different movements come up. It's like something just needed to be like grief was calling out to humanity <laughs> to tend to it through these beings who were listening and who could each write so eloquently on the topic. Oh, for sure. The Yeah, that was Die Wise, was it? Mm -hmm. Jenkinson and Mattel's. Uh, it, the was Smell of Dust. That's right, Rain and Dust. Yeah. So when you're, did you have a, much of a history with your own grief. And you can imagine that you, any of us get to a certain age and we're not touched by it. Yeah. Yeah. I was really moved. Stephen Levine, Stephen and Andrea, they were early influencers for me on um, talking about 
grief and talking about grief in the body. Mm -hmm. Both Francis Weller and Michael Mead, many teachers, talk about this spirit-soul continuum. Mm -hmm. That spirit has a tendency toward rising and ascension and oneness, whereas soul has a tendency downward toward rootedness and entanglement and the dark modern dominant North American culture tends to move in the direction of spirit. Like oneness, always on the up and up. Ascension is a lot down equals bad, uh, dark equals bad in our language. And so I went in my early 20s, I got pretty heavily into Buddhist practice. I'd say I went in that direction of spirit <laughs> and noticed that I had, it kept me at a distance from grief because there was a sense of oh, it's, it's impermanent, it's a cause of suffering. And there would be almost like this kind of witnessing, but not really being touched. And it was actually in a moment, I had a very specific moment in mm -hmm. when my son, who's now 13, when he was born and I caught him, interestingly, in our little meditation room, we had a birth, birthing tub set up. There was Oh, beautiful. Place. And so I caught him and there was just a well that broke and I just wept like I had never wept before in my life. And that cracked through something that then has stayed open in me. So I'm very grateful for that catalyst moment. Carl, you know, your, your story just brought back a memory for me. My parents, they divorced early in my life and through my early years, I never really knew my father. I was essentially raised in a matriarchal family. Years pass, I, I married, and my firstborn was a daughter. Several years later, uh, we were blessed with a son. I was elated uh, to have two beautiful children, and unknown to me, <laughs> there would uh, soon enough be a second son. I don't remember when this happened, uh, but I realized that I, I did know how to raise a boy. And then a slow, growing depression settled in into my life. And my love for my children wasn't affected, but rather it was an internal struggle that was awakening from having a son. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting place we are because I think many men have forgotten how to be with other men. And you know, that's part of what I think the response to the men's movement in the late 80s and 90s with James Hillman and Michael mm -hmm. Mead and Robert Bly, this sense of men being together, not in business competition, or, but really coming together in a soulful way with poetry and music and ritual and starting to almost rehydrate those seeds of mm -hmm. men that have been as long as our species has been on this planet, there have been initiations and gathering and such profound nourishment that comes from deep friendship and connection with other men. And there just aren't those contexts in modern life for many of us. Going out to a bar or going to watch a game together or something doesn't always get to that the same depth that would come through doing an initiation for the young boys coming up or returning from a hunting gathering or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the lack of ritual for young men. Um, yeah, I think sense of having rites of passage and just having a sacredness to acknowledge transitions in life has been lost for children of all genders. Mm -hmm. There's not that sense of something ending and now you're stepping into something, a new identity with the blessings of these wise elders who are looking at you and recognizing what your medicine is and what sort of spark you're carrying and feeding that in some way. We have much more of a culture of conformity and just things influenced by your value being what you can produce or the kind of career you have or that, those sorts of things. Yeah, and I suppose uh, I was just thinking of my own uh, profession being in EMS, and um, it's one of um, certainly is of service, and it probably was one of the best things that happened to me was working in EMS for such a long time. That's um, such a 
so many positive influences on my life. But at the same time, the idea of uh, being any kind of weakness was the guys wouldn't show it. And I guess the last sure. 20 years, more women have come into the profession. And the last service I was with, I think we're at 52% of our population were women, which I think was the best thing that ever happened to that uh, that that job was that now we're getting something different. Now we're getting more of the uh, nurturing influence as opposed to being um, tough. And I know a lot of guys at the time, I always thought they'd been watching way too many police shows because they were acting like that, but that's not the job. Mm. So uh, a hindrance, and uh, I guess that just made it hard. Uh, Iron John, Bly talks about the wound of the mother and, um, and the influence of that. And I'd have to say that I, I certainly experienced that as a child reinforcing the masculinity or what was thought of being strong didn't work so well for me. Yeah. Yeah. There are a lot of unhelpful cultural messages around what it is to be a man. And I think that's when you ask about where have all the men gone in grief circles, it's that sort of thing because grief does require a certain being cracked open, a certain vulnerability, a certain lack of functionality and like as martin prechtel says like when you grieve you should look bad it should really have an effect on you and in terms of that spirit soul commute continuum it's not about getting stronger faster better exceeding grief it's something where you are taken down it's one of the things that francis talks about grief as being this kind of revolutionary emotion because it will not adhere to the demands of productivity it mm -hmm. will not adhere to capitalism grief is its own wild presence yes and, yeah the um in that uh, book grieving beyond gender Doka and martin they, they talk about basically two types of patterns of grieving one is an intuitive where it's the affect the emotional aspect of it and then the other end of the spectrum, they talk about being instrumental, where it's grief is experienced physically, such as restlessness and, and or cognition, they talk about it. And so that's where they say that the men lie, is that it's not that they don't grieve. Uh, they argue that it's the... They gave an example of one man who was grieving in the loss of his daughter, and the wife was obviously very distraught through her grief. But he uh, built a, a, a stone head for the, the grave. Mm -hmm. And yeah. for him, that was using his hands and putting everything that he had into the creation of I, this tombstone that I assume was just a work of art. I was hoping Weller would get an opportunity to talk a little bit about where have all the male voices gone. Mm -hmm. Any thoughts? Yeah. I think that there, there are movements like where my dear colleague, Alexander and I are hosting a men's grief ritual this, this coming weekend, and it's filled with men who are eager to be in that space. And I find it to be quite a fruitful space when men can gather in that way. And part of it is to look at what are the obstacles we face to grieving as men. Some of those things we've talked about, the needing to fall off the horse, so to speak, mm -hmm. and be taken down sometimes by grief. And also, I think Many men are conditioned to be more comfortable with anger, with depression, than grief. So grief can often be masked. Mm -hmm. That what's under the hyper act, the hyper performance is some tender young boy in there. And how to get what's what can be under the way that grief can be pushed to the side and replaced with another layering emotion that's a little more palatable. But I do think that the that they're out there. See, if you have a lot showing up at your place, you've been able to make them feel safe. What kind of messaging are you giving them? Yeah, I think it's authenticity is a big one, that there's no performative quality to it. And that Alexander and I, this is just how we live. We're showing up as ordinary men mm -hmm. uh, who have learned some things about making space to tend to sorrow and tend to loss and to be in community with other men and to have a space that is both sacred, but also just very ordinary to think that we need to be taught 
how to grieve is so symptomatic of the problem because it's really one of the most common thread that links everyone across mm -hmm. gender, across cultures. Everyone knows loss and death and illness and disappointment. And though that's usually what we try to keep tidy and away from other people or mm -hmm. that men try to keep tidy and don't bring, but it's what, it's what unites us. Uh, often we'll start a grief circle just by going around the room and each person introducing themselves with just one thread of grief they're carrying. And it can be much more so now. The grief is coming for the climate and the world, mm -hmm. not just personal grief around my mother or relationships or things like that. But this sense of what's really moving people is the place we've gotten to in the planet mm. or an extinction. And But when you hear a room, there's it's one of the greatest just instant drops into intimacy and into religion. Because if you hear 20 people each share a grief, there's always going to be some thread of, oh, yeah, I'm holding some aspect of that. Oh, I feel I wasn't even aware that there's something that is holding that grief or that sorrow. And so it is something that just can bring us together. Yeah, I've never seen a, a room that jails quicker than when you have people sharing their grief story, or as you say, a, a, an aspect of it. And the, oh, what is it? It's just, I don't know. Is it, they talk about, some people talk about convergence of the hearts. That energy just seems to go around the circle and uh, something spiritually takes place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I would say it, one, it just cuts through all the bullshit, gets you to what's real mm -hmm. under all the pretense or all of the ways that we can show up, whether it's men or a, a mixed room, but the, it gets us to what's real under there. And also, I think you know, Francis Weller has this beautiful line of the task of a mature human being is to hold in one hand and grief mm -hmm. in the other and be stretched larger by them. And when we can really enter the grief and the loss and the sorrow, it opens a space to experience much more vividness in our joy and our gratitude and our appreciation. And so it stretches the capacity of the heart to really be touched by life rather than a sort of numbed out middle range that many people are living in where you don't get too affected by your grief. You also don't get too affected by your joy and appreciation. And there's just this sort of going through the motions. And so I think it opens us up. And that for me also ties into the somatic piece of our, our bodily habits, because many of the, you know, having done hands-on work with people and taught movement for many years, mm -hmm. many of our bodily tension patterns are connected to the grief and loss that we carry. And tension has, there's a relationship between our relaxation and our capacity to feel. And when we soften tension, we're going to feel more and we're not just going to feel the good things more, but we will feel the whole range of human experience, which is why people tend to keep tension and keep such a fast pace. Because if we actually s slow down, mm -hmm. soften and feel, we're going to feel everything that is undigested in terms of grief and loss in ourselves and in the world will also be touched by the beauty. And the wonder and the awe that isn't felt. So for me, it's a there's a strong connection between what's happening in our body and what we have access to around both grief and gratitude and joy, or the whole spectrum of emotional life. Mm -hmm. So you introduce the men in your circle to the somatic exercises? Yeah. Yeah, we do um, work around breath, freeing restrictions in the breath, because that's connected to particularly places through the torso where the feeling life tends to exist more. So in the neck, mm -hmm. in the chest, in the belly, in the base of the pelvis, where a lot of people have pockets of numbness or just don't feel a whole lot. And so it's like we work with movement lessons to peel off layers of the onion so that inner space can be 
more accessible. And again, that we can shed some of the armoring. And sometimes it takes a little bit. It might not happen on the first gathering. Mm -hmm. Um, But to start to, even if you can soften just a little bit, it makes a difference. And grief works in a group. If one person gets cracked open to access something they weren't able to feel before, we share a field. So that's the mm-hmm. bringing grief as an individual process. But like when one person grieves deeply, we all, those who witness also are yes. a part of it. And that's another thing about grief ritual because people can have pressure on themselves. Oh, I hope I am able to access something. But no, some, sometimes your role is just to witness, just to be there and another person and say, I see you. And there's the benefit of that. And that's something I've really learned to trust. And Francis Weller has said his first, at least five or six grief rituals he attended, there were no tears that he hadn't accessed that, but he just, you stay in the container and it starts to work on. I know that this is similar for myself, the uh, feeling like, oh, not a performance, but the idea that, well, I guess I'll talk about this. And when it gets closer and you have that opportunity to either step in or, or not, all of a sudden something else comes into the field and all of a sudden what I was, was thought I was going to talk about, it just spills out in another direction, completely different than what my intention was. It was just like yeah. the, the soul just took over and said, now we're going to talk about this today. Yeah, but, um, yeah. Yeah, and that's that wildness we were talking about earlier, to let something that is known, unprepared, mm-hmm. spontaneous come through. Now, is there a difference in your your circles when there are both uh, men and women present? Do the behaviors change, or do men shy away if they know that uh, women are going to be present? I would say yes or no. There's always differences who shows up. And I do think part of why I like to hold Grief rituals specifically for men is that there is a sense of maybe they're a little more able to access something that they couldn't express if their wives or daughters or friends were Mm. in the room. Yes. But I've also been in spaces where there's a spectrum of genders and people just show up with great authenticity. So it really varies. But I think so much of it is just the holding a container of depth and inviting people to come as they are. Yes, you're right. Being authentic is a prerequisite for organic blooming of heartfelt stories. I had attended a Celtic workshop uh, this past summer with 15 people, and I was the only male. And as we were winding down, some of the women began sharing their stories of grief, and so it wasn't long before I did as well. Several months later, I began to wonder, so why no men? So I turned to my shamanic friends who teach journeying skills and inquired about the men who show up to their classes. And you guessed that in comparison to female students, not many. Uh, So I'm left wondering, Carl, is there a commonality of how men approach grief and spiritual development? And I was wondering, you know, can you speak to this at all? Yeah, I think it just takes... There's a certain vulnerability required to follow any path that's going to lead to change and transformation. So there has to be a willingness to not know. And sometimes that can be a struggle, again, for those that condition, I got to pull myself up by my bootstraps. I can take care of this. I got it figured out. Anything that's going to be transformational will require a reshaping. And sometimes that can be a little bit more difficult. But again, I see in a lot of the circles I run in, there are many men who are just hungry for that sort of depth and connection and willingness to be reshaped. Mm -hmm. And I've been in these beautiful circles in the Redwoods with Michael Mead and a hundred men of varying races and socioeconomic backgrounds and cultures and the just the depth of connection and vitality that can come when people show up at the depth of conflict because there's a lot of there's a lot of unmetabolized age and loss that exists too and to have a context where 
disagreement can happen without violence where uh, we can really, I, I always love this description from Michael Mead and it speaks a lot to what we're talking mm-hmm. around grief and transformation. And he says, there are these three levels interaction. Level one is just surface we're talking about the Super Bowl and the weather and kind of surface conventional reality. And then the third level is just soulful, authentic depth connection. And the second level between those is all of the unresolved grief and mm. anger and loss that exists. And that you can't get to that third level unless you sink down through that second level. And that's where you have a lot of spiritual bypassing or things like you just want to get right to the oneness or you just want to get right to the soulful connection. But you actually need to go through something that's pretty difficult uh, en route, that you need to see what is it that's created the disconnection and having spaces where we can be in that second place. It's, it's, there's a lot of heat there. Mm-hmm. And so it requires containment. But when we are able to sit in that together, especially as men, the richness of getting to the, that authenticity of that level three is just, it's something that I wish for so many men to experience. I can remember holding a grief circle for women. What made this notable was the anger that came and spread. Every woman had experienced some form of abuse. I held space while witnessing their anger, their grief, and their losses that they had experienced. This was incredibly powerful. And most of all, it was a testament to the courage of these women. Yeah. Yeah. And it's another, it's an edge because there has been and is so much violence and objectification Mm -hmm. against. And so how to bear witness and also how to not uh, equate masculinity with toxic. And I think this is a a challenge for many boys growing up. They will hear the word probably toxic masculinity more than they will hear just masculine. And again, because we don't have these The role models and elders who actually model what a healthy relationship is, what a healthy relationship to the erotic world, what a healthy relationship to power and respect can be. It's it's, There can be a sense of, I'm ashamed to be a man because men have caused so many problems and we need to Mm -hmm. sift out and look at the violence and look at the institutionalized misogyny that is present in so many places and to tune toward something different. Yeah. One quick question, Carl, before we end, for because it was mentioned, where would people who wanted to expand their spiritual development or moving through their grief of the different somatic uh, instructions that are, are available, where can oh. take classes? Yeah, we have classes that we offer uh, through our website, embodimentmatters.com. Um, but there are lots of different somatic modalities. I find Resma Menicum's author of My Grandmother's Hands, does some beautiful looking at embodiment and racialized trauma, how it's passed mm-hmm. down through the generations. Somatic experiencing is another modality that helps people to really work with embodiment. The Feldenkrais, like I mentioned earlier, that's a beautiful way to learn to move with more ease and presence and soften those rigidities that keep us from feeling. Okay. I'll look for that and I'll put it in the show notes when I get to dig into that one. Mm -hmm. But I want to offer you my deep appreciation, Carl, for this conversation. Um, In some ways I'm speechless, but you have such a beautiful way of expressing. You can see a little bit of Weller coming out a little bit, and and that's if, if when I grow up I want to be like Weller. <laughs> yeah, me too. I'll take that as a compliment for yeah. sure. Yeah, yeah. Cool. even throwing a little bit of uh, Stephen Jenkinson in there. <laughs> but anyway, so thank you so much. Yeah, thank you very much, John. It was a delight to talk about all the, these things we discussed today. Yeah, well, you take care. As we close today's episode, we carry with us the profound insights and heartfelt stories shared by Carl Rabke, his journey through griefs, embodiment, 
and the silent struggles of men has opened a gateway to deeper understanding and compassion. Let's hold space for the unspoken sorrows and the transformative power of vulnerability in our lives and communities. Remember, healing begins with listening, sharing, and embracing the full spectrum of our human experience. So thank you for joining us on this journey of exploration and connection. Until next time, may we all find the courage to face our grief with open hearts and support one another in our paths to healing. We will leave you with the music of David Celeste, The Seeds We Sow.